Hello everyone and welcome back to Edith Wharton's The Age of Innocence. I'm Nicole from the Gettysburg Library and this is Chapter 19. The day was fresh, with a lively spring wind full of dust. All the old ladies in both families had got out their faded sables and yellowing ermines, and the smell of camphor from the front pews almost smothered the faint spring scent of the lilies banking the altar. Newland Archer, at a signal from the sexton, had come out of the vestry and placed himself with his best man on the chancel step of Grace Church. The signal meant that the brougham bearing the bride and her father was in sight, but there was sure to be a considerable interval of adjustment and consultation in the lobby, where the bridesmaids were already hovering like a cluster of Easter blossoms. During this unavoidable lapse of time, the bridegroom, in proof of his eagerness, was expected to expose himself, alone, to the gaze of the assembled company. And Archer had gone through this formality as resignedly as through all the others, which made of a 19th-century New York wedding a rite that seemed to belong to the dawn of history. Everything was equally easy, or equally painful, as one chose to put it. In the path he was committed to tread, and he had obeyed the flurried injunctions of his best man as piously as other bridegrooms had obeyed his own, in the days when he had guided them through the same labyrinth. So far he was reasonably sure of having fulfilled all his obligations. The bridesmaids, eight bouquets of white lilac and lilies of the valley, had been sent in due time, as well as the gold and sapphire sleeve links of the eight ushers, and the best man's cat's-eye scarf pin. Archer had set up half the night trying to vary the wording of his thanks for the last batch of presents from men friends and ex-lady loves. The fees for the bishop and the rector were safely in the pocket of his best man. His own luggage was already at Mrs. Manson Mingott's, where the wedding breakfast was to take place, and so were the traveling clothes into which he was to change, and a private compartment had been engaged in the train that was to carry the young couple to their unknown destination. Concealment of the spot in which the bridal night was to be spent being one of the most sacred taboos of the prehistoric ritual. "'Got the ring all right?' whispered young Vander Lloyd Newland, who was inexperienced in the duties of a best man and awed by the weight of his responsibility. Archer made the gesture which he had seen so many bridegrooms make. With his ungloved right hand, he felt in the pocket of his dark gray waistcoat and assured himself that the little gold circlet, engraved inside, Newland to May with the date, was in its place. Then, resuming his former attitude, his tall hat and pearl-gray gloves with black stitchings grasped in his left hand, he stood looking at the door of the church. Overhead, Handel's march swelled pompously through the imitation stone vaulting, carrying on its waves the faded drift of the many weddings at which, with cheerful indifference, he had stood on the same chancel step, watching other brides float up the nave toward other bridegrooms. How like the first night at the opera, he thought, recognizing all the same faces in the same boxes, no, pews, and wondering if, when the last trump sounded, Mrs. Selfridge Mary would be there with the same towering ostrich feathers in her bonnet, and Mrs. Beaufort with the same diamond earrings and the same smile, and whether suitable proscenium seats were already prepared for them in another world. After that, there was still time to review, one by one, the familiar countenances in the first rows, the women sharp with curiosity and excitement, the men's sulky with obligation of having to put on their frock coats before luncheon and fight for food at the wedding breakfast. Oh, too bad the breakfast is at old Catherine's, the bridegroom could fancy Reggie Chiver saying, but I'm told that Lovell Mingott insisted on its being cooked by his own chef, so it ought to be good if only one can get at it. And he could imagine Sillerton Jackson adding with authority, My dear fellow, haven't you heard? It's to be served at small tables, in the new English fashion. Archer's eyes lingered a moment on the left-hand pew, where his mother, who had entered the church on Mr. Henry Vander Lloyden's arm, sat weeping softly under her Chantilly veil, her hands in her grandmother's ermine muff. Poor Janie, he thought, looking at his sister. Even by screwing her head around, she can only see the people in the few front pews, and they're mostly dowdy Newlands and Dagonettes. On the hither side of the white ribbon dividing off the seats reserved for the families, he saw Beaufort, tall and red-faced, scrutinizing the women with his arrogant stare. Beside him sat his wife, all silvery chinchilla and violets, 
and on the far side of the ribbon, Lawrence Leffert's sleekly brushed head seemed to mount guard over the invisible deity of good form who presided at the ceremony. Archer wondered how many flaws Leffert's keen eyes would discover in the ritual of his divinity. Then he suddenly recalled that he too had once thought such questions important. The things that had filled his days seemed now like a nursery parody of life, or like the wrangles of medieval schoolmen over metaphysical terms that nobody had ever understood. A stormy discussion as to whether the wedding presents should be shown had darkened the last hours before the wedding, and it seemed inconceivable to Archer that grown-up people should work themselves into a state of agitation over such trifles, and that the matter should have been decided, in the negative, by Mrs. Welland saying, with indignant tears, I should as soon turn the reporters loose in my house. Yet, there was a time when Archer had had definite and rather aggressive opinions on all such problems, and when everything concerning the manners and customs of his little tribe had seemed to him fraught with worldwide significance. And all the while, I suppose, he thought, real people were living somewhere and real things happening to them. There they come, breathed the best man excitedly. But the bridegroom knew better. The cautious opening of the door of the church meant only that Mr. Brown, the livery stable keeper, gowned in black in his intermittent character of a sexton, was taking a preliminary survey of the scene before marshalling his forces. The door was softly shut again. Then, after another interval, it swung majestically open, and a murmur ran through the church. The family! Mrs. Welland came first on the arm of her eldest son. Her large pink face was appropriately solemn, and her plum-colored satin with blue pale side panels and blue ostrich plumes in a small satin bonnet met with general approval. But before she had settled herself with a stately rustle in the pew opposite Mrs. Archer's, the spectators were craning their necks to see who was coming after her. Wild rumors had been abroad the day before to the effect that Mrs. Manson Mingott, in spite of her physical disabilities, had resolved on being present at the ceremony, and the idea was so much in keeping with her sporting character that bets ran high at the clubs as to her being able to walk up the nave and squeeze into a seat. It was known that she had insisted on sending her own carpenter to look into the possibility of taking down the end panel of the front pew and to measure the space between the seat and the front, but the result had been discouraging, and for one anxious day, her family had watched her dallying with the plan of being wheeled up the nave in her enormous bath chair and sitting enthroned in it at the foot of the chancel. The idea of this monstrous exposure of her person was so painful to her relations that they could have covered with gold the ingenious person who suddenly discovered that the chair was too wide to pass between the iron uprights of the awning, which extended from the church door to the curbstone. The idea of doing away with this awning and revealing the bride to the mob of dressmakers and newspaper reporters who stood outside, fighting to get near the joints of canvas, exceeded even old Catherine's courage. Though, for a moment, she had weighed the possibility. Why, they might take a photograph of my child and put it in the papers, Mrs. Welland exclaimed, when her mother's last plan was hinted to her. And from this unthinkable indecency, the clan recoiled with a collective shudder. The ancestress had had to give in, but her concession was bought only by the promise that the wedding breakfast should take place under her roof, though, as the Washington Square connection said, with the Wellens' house in easy reach, it was hard to have to make a special price with Brown to drive one to the other end of nowhere. Though all these transactions had been widely reported by the Jacksons, a sporting minority still clung to the belief that old Catherine would appear in church, and there was a distinct lowering of the temperature when she was found to have been replaced by her daughter-in-law. Mrs. Lovell Mingott had the high color and glassy stare induced in ladies of her age and habit by the effort of getting into a new dress. But once the disappointment occasioned by her mother-in-law's non-appearance had subsided, it was agreed that her black chantilly over lilac satin, with a bonnet of parma violets, formed the happiest contrast to Mrs. Welland's blue and plum color. Far different was the impression produced by the gaunt and mincing lady who followed on Mr. Mingott's arm in a wild dishevelment of stripes and fringes and floating scarves, and as this last apparition glided into view, Archer's heart contracted, 
and stopped beating. He had taken it for granted that the Marchioness Manson was still in Washington, where she had gone some four weeks previously with her niece, Madame Olenska. It was generally understood that their abrupt departure was due to Madame Olenska's desire to remove her aunt from the baleful eloquence of Dr. Agathon Carver, who had nearly succeeded in enlisting her as a recruit for the Valley of Love. And in the circumstances, no one had expected either of the ladies to return for the wedding. For a moment, Archer stood, with his eyes fixed on Medora's fantastic figure, straining to see who came behind her. But the little procession was at an end, for all the lesser members of the family had taken their seats, and the eight tall ushers, gathering themselves together like birds, or insects, preparing for some migratory maneuver, were already slipping through the side doors into the lobby. Newland, I say, she's here, the best man whispered. Archer roused himself with a start. A long time had apparently passed since his heart had stopped beating for the white and rosy procession was in fact halfway up the nave. The bishop, the rector, and two white-winged assistants were hovering about the flower-banked altar, and the first chords of the Spohr symphony were strewing their flower-like notes before the bride. Archer opened his eyes. Could they really have been shut as he imagined, and felt his heart beginning to resume its usual task? The music, the scent of the lilies on the altar— the vision of the cloud of tulle and orange blossoms floating nearer and nearer, the sight of Mrs. Archer's face suddenly convulsed with happy sobs, the low benedictory murmur of the rector's voice, the ordered evolutions of the eight pink bridesmaids and the eight black ushers, all these sights, sounds, and sensations, so familiar in themselves, so utterably strange and meaningless in his new relation to them, were confusedly mingled in his brain. My God, he thought, have I got the ring? And once more, he went through the bridegroom's convulsive gesture. Then, in a moment, May was beside him, such radiance streaming from her that it sent a faint warmth through his numbness, and he straightened himself and smiled into her eyes. Dearly beloved, we are gathered together here, the rector began. The ring was on her hand. The bishop's benediction had been given, the bridesmaids were apoised to resume their place in the procession, and the organ was showing preliminary symptoms of breaking out into the Mendelssohn march, without which no newly wedded couple had ever emerged upon New York. "'Your arm! I say, give her your arm!' young Newland nervously hissed. And once more, Archer became aware of having been adrift, far off into the unknown. "'What was it that had sent him there?' he wondered." Perhaps the glimpse, among other anonymous spectators in the transept, of a dark coil of hair under a hat which, a moment later, revealed itself as belonging to an unknown lady with a long nose, so laughably unlike the person whose image she had evoked, that he asked himself if he were becoming subject to hallucinations. And now he and his wife were pacing slowly down the nave, carried forward on the light Mendelssohn ripples, the spring day beckoning to them through the widely open doors, and Mrs. Welland's chestnuts, with big white favors on their frontlets, curvetting and showing off at the far end of the canvas tunnel. The footman, who had a still bigger white favor on his lapel, wrapped May's white cloak about her, and Archer jumped into the brougham at her side. She turned to him with a triumphant smile, and their hands clasped under her veil. Darling, Archer said, and suddenly the same black abyss yawned before him, and he felt himself sinking into it, deeper and deeper, while his voice rambled on smoothly and cheerfully. Yes, of course, I, I thought I'd lost the ring. No wedding would be complete if the poor devil of a bridegroom didn't go through that. But you did keep me waiting, you know. I had time to think of every horror that might possibly happen. She surprised him by turning in full Fifth Avenue and flinging her arms about his neck. But none ever can happen now, can it, Newland? as long as we two are together. Every detail of the day had been so carefully thought out that the young couple, after the wedding breakfast, had ample time to put on their traveling clothes, descend the wide mingot stairs between laughing bridesmaids and weeping parents, and get into the brougham under the traditional shower of rice and satin slippers, and there was still half an hour left in which to drive to the station, buy the last weeklies at the bookstall with the air of seasoned travelers, and settle themselves in the reserved compartment, in which May's maid had already placed her dove-colored traveling cloak and glaringly new dressing-bag from London. 
the old Dulac aunts at Rhinebeck had put their house at the disposal of the bridal couple, with a readiness inspired by the prospect of spending a week in New York with Mrs. Archer. And Archer, glad to escape the usual bridal suite in a Philadelphia or Baltimore hotel, had accepted with an equal alacrity. May was enchanted at the idea of going to the country, and childishly amused at the vain efforts of the eight bridesmaids to discover where their mysterious retreat was situated. It was thought very English to have a country house lent to one, and the fact gave a last touch of distinction to what was generally conceded to be the most brilliant wedding of the year. But where the house was, no one was permitted to know, except the parents of bride and groom who, when taxed with the knowledge, pursed their lips and said mysteriously, Ah, they didn't tell us, which was manifestly true since there was no need to. Once they were settled in their compartment and the train, shaking off the endless wooden suburbs, had pushed out into the pale landscape of spring. Talk became easier than Archer had expected. May was still, in look and tone, the simple girl of yesterday, eager to compare notes with him as to the incidents of the wedding, and discussing them as impartially as a bridesmaid talking it all over with an usher. At first, Archer had fancied that this detachment was the disguise of an inward tremor, but her clear eyes revealed only the most tranquil unawareness. She was alone for the first time with her husband. But her husband was only the charming comrade of yesterday. There was no one whom she liked as much, no one whom she trusted as completely, and the culminating lark of the whole delightful adventure of engagement and marriage was to be off with him alone on a journey, like a grown-up person, like a married woman, in fact. It was wonderful that, as he had learned in the mission garden at St. Augustine, such depths of feeling could coexist with such absence of imagination. But he remembered how, even then, she had surprised him by dropping back to inexpressive girlishness as soon as her conscience had been eased of its burden. And he now saw that she would probably go through life dealing to the best of her ability with each experience as it came, but never anticipating any by so much as a stolen glance. Perhaps that faculty of unawareness was what gave her eyes their transparency and her face the look of representing a type rather than a person, as if she might have been chosen to pose for a civic virtue or a Greek goddess. The blood that ran so close to her fair skin might have been a preserving fluid rather than a ravaging element. Yet her look of indestructible youthfulness made her seem neither hard nor dull, but only primitive and pure. In the thick of this meditation, Archer suddenly felt himself looking at her with the startled gaze of a stranger, and plunged into a reminiscence of the wedding breakfast, and of Granny Mingott's immense and triumphant pervasion of it. May settled down to a frank enjoyment of the subject. I was surprised, though, weren't you, that, that Aunt Medora came after all. Ellen wrote that they were neither of them well enough to take the journey. I do wish it had been she who had recovered. Did you see the exquisite old lace she sent me? He had known that the moment must come sooner or later, but he had somewhat imagined that by force of willing he might hold it at bay. Yes, I... No, uh, yes, it was beautiful, he said, looking at her blindly, and wondering if, whenever he heard those two syllables, all his carefully built-up world would tumble about him like a house of cards. Aren't you tired? It will be good to have some tea when we arrive. I'm sure the ants have got everything beautifully ready. He rattled on, taking her hand in his, and her mind rushed away instantly to the magnificent tea and coffee service of Baltimore silver which the Beauforts had sent, and which went so perfectly with Uncle Lovell Mingott's trays and side dishes. In the spring twilight, the train stopped at the Rhinebeck station, and they walked along the platform to the waiting carriage. Ah, how awfully kind of the Vanderloydens. They've sent their man over from Squirtercliff to meet us, Archer exclaimed, as a sedate person out of livery approached them and relieved the maid of her bags. "'I'm extremely sorry, sir,' said this emissary, "'that a little accident has occurred at the Miss Dulocks, a leak in the water tank. It happened yesterday, and Mr. Vanderloyden, who heard of it this morning, sent a housemaid up by the early train to get the patroon's house ready. It will be quite comfortable, I think you'll find, sir, and the Miss Dulocks have sent their cook over, so that it will be exactly the same as if you've been at Rhinebeck.' Archer stared at the speaker so blankly that he repeated in still more apologetic accents, "'It will be exactly the same, sir, I do assure you.' 
and May's eager voice broke out, covering the embarrassed silence. The same as Rhinebeck? The Patroon's house? Oh, but it will be a hundred thousand times better, won't it, Newland? It's too dear and kind of Mr. Vanderloyden to have thought of it. And as they drove off, with the maid beside the coachman, and their shining bridal bags on the seat before them, she went on excitedly, Only fancy, I've never been inside it, have you? The Vanderloyden show it to so few people, but, but they opened it for Ellen, it seems, and she told me what a darling little place it was. She says it's the only house she's seen in America that she could imagine being perfectly happy in. <laughs> well, that's what we're going to be, isn't it? cried her husband gaily, and she answered with her boyish smile. Oh, it's just our luck beginning, the wonderful luck we're always going to have together. <laughs>